dollars to donuts with your host, Steve Portugal. Welcome to Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where I talk with the people who lead user research in their organization. There were eight of us, a cluster of 10 year old boys, all posed around the kitchen table or the other horizontal surfaces in the room, awaiting the culinary culmination of this birthday party when pop and chips would give way to the chocolate birthday cake. The flaming dessert made its appearance and we warbled happy birthday to the celebrant, mischievously goading him about his simian appearance and his odor. And with that, the cake was ours. Paper plates and metal forks, droplets of melted wax that we flicked off the frosting, fragments of decorative icing. So we set to our primal task, inhaling sugar and chocolate and, and oh yeah, did I mention sugar? Noticing something about my headlong progress through my slice, my friend paused and looked up from his own cake, curiously asking me, So, you don't save the best for last? This was a new concept to me, and I stared blankly, the crumbs leaking out of the corners of my mouth. His mother popped by to affirm, Yes, Stephen, we save the best part for last. Beyond surprised, I was enlightened. Of course some parts of the cake had more value than others. A forkful of plain old cake wasn't as good as cake and frosting, which itself wasn't as good as that mouthful of corner mega frosting. But the big news was that I had an option to eat towards an end goal. I could eat differently, portioning, partitioning, and planning, suffering through the the not-the-best bite so that down the road a slice, I would have the absolute best bite. That would become my reward, and that was something to work towards. Gratification delayed was gratification improved. In a fundamental way, this exchange broke me. Decades later, I am still struggling to effect repairs. I absorbed a significant lesson, that even a tiny in-the-moment decision can have consequences, risks, and downsides. These days, still I notice, with hardly any conscious thought, that I actively manage how much salsa to put on a tortilla chip, weighing that if I take too much from the little container, I could end up chomping away on dry, salsa-less chips by the end of the meal. As eaters, we face moments for optimizing, or at least risk mitigating, constantly. Food designers don't seem to consider this aspect in their apportioning, whether it's Lunchables or an airplane snack box or a hummus platter or a charcuterie plate. There's an intended combination, nominally meat or cheese or spread on bread or cracker, and it's by design. But the quantities are rarely calibrated so that there's a cracker for every morsel of cheese, etc., Of course we can eat things in a variety of ways, and an extra apple slice isn't really a problem. But a solitary dollop of marmalade is absolutely a fail. And so when designers don't consider this, it falls to us, the concerned eater, to plan, calculate, adapt. And for some of us, that isn't an enjoyable part of the experience. Indeed, the affordances, the aesthetics in a bundle of base and toppings is that we are consuming a set of choices, a purposeful selection of quantities of elements. So the mismatch is just that much worse when the cues tell us to expect coherence. Going beyond what may be dismissed as my compulsiveness, this is really about being present. It's hard to be present with your food, or indeed be present at all, if you consider what may happen in the future, worrying about potential micro-annoyances. Navigating the pleasure of being present with the pressures of what lies ahead is the burden and freedom of being an adult, of constantly having to make choices. And at my most hopeful, I would consider this learning about the best for last less as a fracture to my equanimity and more as an important and inevitable loss of innocence. Here's another zero-budget episode to share with you. And I want to remind you that you can support Dollars to Donuts by supporting my small business. Here are some of the ways that I work with companies. The first is user research. I work well in situations where the team already knows some things about a set of users. Often they each know something different and they have strong beliefs about this and there's no way to get from anecdotal familiarity to an actual framework to make decisions. Often this is research about people rather than a product. These don't have to be blue sky generative necessarily, but we're trying to create alignment and share belief from the insights we gain from the research. The second is a player coach role, where I work with people who do research or maybe a junior research person on a project, and they're making use of my expertise, but they're going to own the project from start to finish. I come in to advise some parts of the process, roll my sleeves up for other parts of the process, depending on what the team needs. The third is as a team coach, 
where I'm an available resource, maybe office hours or some other format, so that people can come with questions, seek feedback, and so on. I'm not usually doing any of the research process itself. I'm just there to talk, give feedback, review documents, and so on. The next is training. For people who are looking to do more research, uh, improving their skills, it's a half-day to two-day curriculum on planning research, interviewing, and analyzing data. A master class is typically for a research team that has a particular area of interest. This is a customized combination of a lecture, of exercises, and facilitation. And the last here is alignment facilitation, where I'm there to bring together a group of people to identify and sort through different issues. It's often around optimizing and improving the process for user research, for design, and for other ways to get user-centered products through the organization and out into the marketplace. So if I can help your team, please get in touch. All right, let's get to my interview with Chris Covell, who heads UX research at First Abu Dhabi Bank. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being on Dollars to Donuts. It's great to have the chance to speak with you. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Chris. I head up UX research at First Abu Dhabi Bank. How long have you been in that role? First Abu Dhabi Bank is the biggest bank in the region. So I, I work in uh, Dubai and I've been here for about uh, 14 months. And did you join the organization to take on this role? Yes. Uh, so within the organization, there is uh, an innovation lab. So Fabric, First Abu Dhabi Bank's Research and Innovation Center. And in that uh, position, I uh, head up the research and uh, that uh, position was created. And I um, decided to, uh, to, to take the plunge and go out to uh, Dubai. And, and it's been a, a great experience. Do you have, I mean, this is an unfair question, but you may have some, some context since some, this happened before you got there, but do you know what led to the identification of the need for this role, creation of the role, the conditions that were established that led you to start talking with the organization and join? So yeah, the history of, of um, the lab or the um, or fabric, it started about two years ago. So my boss, the head of research for fab, a guy named Gavin, he was brought on to really try to help with the digital transformation. First Abu Dhabi Bank's a really big bank, like, like I said, biggest bank in the region. And um, in terms of technology, in terms of digitizing the products and the services, that was really the mission of the uh, the Innovation Lab or, or Fabric, as we call ourselves now. And in terms of research, um, Gavin kind of comes from a software engineering and, and design background and uh, knew that research was going to be very important in terms of creating products and digitizing products. And um, the other kind of core mission, uh, other than digital transformation that Fabric has, uh, is kind of spreading a culture of, of innovation within the bank. And that means empowering other departments, not just the innovation lab, to be innovative, to think kind of like designers, to be problem kind of obsessed. And all that um, and kind of requires research. And uh, hopefully we can get into kind of how that how that happens. Well, that's no time like the present. So how does that happen? There's a lot of different ways to kind of come at it, I, at least from my perspective. In terms of, of kind of developing products, you know, I think when research, we like to follow design thinking principles. Um, it comes out of uh, the D school, uh, most famously in uh, Stanford. But it traces all the way back to a guy named John Arnold, who came out with a kind of a book pamphlet, um, I think in the 50s or 50s or 60s called Creative Engineering. And uh, it's just a, a, a way of thinking about problems, problems, right? And, and needs, right? So when you think about problems, when you think about, about needs from, from a customer point of view, um, that will allow you to kind of frame issues and then solve them through products and services. Most of the time when research kind of gets embedded, in my opinion, into this design thinking framework, either uh, up front and, and uh, towards the end of, of the product uh, life cycle. So I kind of think of it as bookends and upfront or kind of uh, upstream is a lot of times when you're trying to find the need. Uh, and then downstream is a lot of times just smoothing out the experience or smoothing out the product through, through testing. We do both at the uh, innovation lab, but I, I'm very passionate about the upstream kind of research because it's, it's really where these, the tricky problems are, you know, trying to understand human motivation is, is not a simple thing sometimes. You know, from your perspective, or maybe from all, all of the, the folks in Fabric, the value of understanding human motivation in terms of how it applies to the kinds of products and services or decisions that have to be made in a financial institution 
maybe that's clear to you. How does the rest of the organization see that relationship between, hey, we need to understand human motivation because here's what we're going to do as a bank? Yeah, it's a learning experience to to answer that question, because that was something that I kind of have found wherever I've worked throughout my career as other people who kind of don't, you know, live the UX kind of world or the user research world are really being obsessed about the customer and making the product kind of fit the customer's needs is is a, is a difficult one. I mean, it's about education. It, you know, at Fabric, we have four core components w- within the, the lab. So one is research, one is accelerate, which is kind of more of a more design. One is fintech. We can get into that if, if you'd like. And then the last one, and arguably the most important one, is culture. And that is just an education piece, right? It's it's getting people to come and walk through the lab and show them how and the, the pods that we do user testing uh, with uh, to kind of do roadshows to kind of get the word out there. We've we've done hackathons where we bring people together for kind of you know, interactive brainstorming. Um, we do talks and kind of fireside chats about design thinking and why they why people should care. So it's um, it's difficult, right? Because culture is kind of a amorphous, uh, intangible thing, and, and to change it, it, it's hard to change it if, if you, you can't even put your finger on it. Sometimes, so it's it's a work in progress. But um, at the end of the day, it's it really is just about people and about just talking with them and and kind of getting the word out there. And you know, in the beginning, the the bank kind of you know we we had some slow slow days in, uh, to begin with, but slowly but surely after that we start. To, especially within research, after we start delivering value and they kind of see the power of answering questions and being kind of evidence-based, um, then I think that there's two ways. I think it's the education and then it's also delivering high quality re- um, projects. I mean, one of the things that you know we talk about in research is in addition to doing quality work is, is having influence, is having people sort of be willing to hear yeah. that information that maybe challenges their beliefs um, and then ideally take some action based on, on that. And so you're talking about driving this change. What have you seen on, on that side of things in terms of, I mean, believing, engaging with, taking new, new perspectives on and then you know, having that influence the decisions that are being made? Yeah, a couple of things on, on, on that point. So first off, you know, most of the time, I, I probably argue, arguably all of the time, when a, a group comes to, to us to get, get some research, it's usually a question that um, is, is pretty polarizing. You know, I'm, it's research and, and also in many ways I've found is kind of a, a way for people to kind of settle internal conflict or uh, settle internal debate. So, you know, these the results that we, we provide are, are really matter and, and they really kind of take it to heart. But that's a good thing. But the other, the kind of bad thing sometimes is that when you're in the room and you're kind of, you know, for example, if you're testing a, an application and you had pe- designers and, and product managers kind of working really, really hard to making things good. And in many cases, the research is the questions that we ask, the data that's presented in many cases is really uh, negative and in, in, in sometimes and not negative, but, but, but it's, it's kind of supposed to be. That's why that's why the research is there. And to kind of manage that uh, in, in the room ha- is something that uh, yeah, it's a it's a learning experience. But, you know, we're kind of human. We get we get defensive. Uh, the, the people who are in the room are, are human and they get defensive uh, when when the research is being is being presented sometimes. So that's just something you have to be kind of conscious of. You know, I, I tell a lot of the, the younger junior guys that, you know, there's a certain way to kind of couch the the r- reports and the and the data. And when kind of in fighting begins in, in the room, you kind of have to just take a breath and and really just look back at the uh, rely on the methods. And, and that's why, in my opinion, the methods and the way you present and the quality of the research is so important, because uh, if it's done well, and it's executed properly, then the data is the data, and you can kind of just, you know, sleep well at night, uh, even if it's it caused some internal strain. So, um, so that's kind of kind of the first point. The other one about about taking uh, them taking it forward, right, is, is a kind of an interesting one. It's me and me and Gab and my my boss. We we kind of go back and forth about this um, a lot. And in my kind of philosophy is that the data is the data. Sometimes they want us to recommend, uh, and sometimes they don't. But in terms of solutioning, that's kind of their. I mean, we're we're the researchers, right? And they kind of are the product owners. And if the 
if the research and the project is scoped up in, in a way that's that's pretty narrow and they just have a couple of questions and we kind of provide that that information, if they kind of because of politics or because of infighting or because of you know other bulwarks, if they don't take it forward, then it's it's kind of out of out of our hands, which is a kind of arguably good and bad. I don't know how do how do you see it? Yeah, this is a personal hot button of mine. You know, how do we measure our own success? I'll tell you, I had a, a kind of a galvanizing experience a number of years ago with a friend of mine who had worked with a number of design agencies. And we decided to meet and share our capabilities presentations as a way of just learning about each other and learning from each other. These were public documents that we, we could share comfortably. And, you know, I, I had all these stories where research had uncovered something really, really, things that were really insightful and, and potentially impactful to these business areas that my clients were working on. And, uh, I kept saying, you know, unfortunately, this didn't happen or they weren't ready or they decided not to. And he kind of stopped me and said, like, Steve, you're not in the business of them shipping a product. You're in the business of highlighting opportunities. And that that was really grounding for me, I think, as I, I want my success stories to be success stories and not failure stories, but we can't control everything, you know, and I think it's a little distressing to hear researchers tag their own success to a thing that's ultimately out of their control. Yeah, um, that's, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I agree, I agree with all that. And I think it's kind of, if you look at kind of the, the different levels of the macro and the micro, it's like, it, I think if you're, if you think about, about it, in the macro level, right? So the product that I'm researching, is it going to be a success or failure? Um, then that's, that's definitely, it, it can be kind of disheartening, right? If you do all this really good work and then the, the product kind of dies or it goes away or it, it takes a, a different direction, a direction that the research isn't what, you know, uh, kind of away from the research findings. Um, but if you look at it in the, in the macro and just kind of look at each project as each project and as long as, you know, you hit this, hit, ticked all the boxes in the scope and you kind of went out and you, you know, you did the, the research the way it should, should have been done, um, or the way that you wanted it to go and then report and reported it. And, um, then you can kind of, I think rest easy if you just kind of look at it with kind of na very narrow, with kind of almost with, with blinders on, but it's hard sometimes, right? It changes. And I think you're, you're kind of alluding to this a little bit. It changes based on how emotionally we invested we are uh, as individuals. And, you know, I work as a consultant, so I love my clients and I am super engaged, but at the end of the project, you know, they have to move forward without me. So I have a, I have a way to detach my success or failure or, you know, how I identify my own success or failure because a project ends, uh, even if a relationship continues, there's a point where the, the, that's over. You know, you are part of an organization, even though fabric is a center, it's in the name. I mean, I wonder if different researchers just based on sort of where they sit in the organization or, you know, how they feel about their own ownership of that product or their own ownership of that team. I wonder if their own assessment of what success looks like varies for them. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if for me, if I'm kind of okay with just delivering and then, and then kind of moving on to the next thing and kind of judging the success project by project, not kind of the overall life cycle. I'm, I'm wondering if I, it was kind of imprinted on, on my brain kind of from the, the early days when I first uh, got into uh, doing research. So I, I, I worked originally or you know, fresh out of college uh, in Manhattan at a human factors engineering firm, very small kind of boutique firm. And we would work for on uh, interesting and, and cut with big, big clients like Google and Amgen and others, Nike. But it was literally like the brief would come in and, you know, a month or two and we would do the research and then we wouldn't hear anything because of, you know, confidentiality situations and, and and what have you so it was very much just like here's the here's the findings here's the data and then on to the next thing and i got very comfortable with that so it might just be i don't know maybe how you get your start but i, I wonder how if there are teams out there where researchers are kind of embedded into the whole product from kind of soup to nuts from cradle to grave uh and if if they um they prefer that or if they prefer for, for me, I love one of the reasons why I, I love research is because one week you can be working on digital wallets and the next week on a, per, a personal loan app. And I, I love, I love the versatility and the diversity of working on many different types of projects and kind of moving on to the next one. 
You make a really good point that, you know, sort of how you were raised up, how did you get your start and what sort of model formed for you versus, you know, the experiences we had versus someone that's part of a team and maybe sees themselves as being tied to the success of that product. You know, I wonder, and again, I'm super biased because of how my approach was formed and how I operate now. But I wonder about like, what's good for research? And I feel like the truth to power role that we play is essential. And being self-contained or self-sufficient, like we're going to do great work and then we're going to help you as much as we possibly can. But that next part is up to you. That mindset to me seems good for a truth to power, you know, role. But, you know, what I've come to admire with people who are embedded is, you know, and maybe fabric is different than my business. You are part of a larger organization. I already talked about culture, but being embedded and working long term with people kind of day to day, sitting with them. Those researchers, they really know those people. They can influence literally from the inside, right? They're part of that team. I don't know what you're seeing with Fabric as you build relationships. Well, for me, I think um, I'm kind of torn, right? Because I, I can see the value in kind of embedding a researcher or two uh, from the beginning of the product to kind of the, the end to sh when it's shipping or when it's becoming live. But I think there's also value in the uh, outsider kind of role that sometimes we, we play as being brought into a new project or on a new product team and kind of not having all those internal biases and, and kind of the curse of knowledge, right? That research kind of, it's just another, it's another set of user eyes, new fresh eyes uh, of seeing, seeing the product and kind of looking at it from, from different, different point of views. I don't know. I, I think that there, if you really kind of take a step back and kind of look at a product or a service life cycle and no two are the same, but I, I really like kind of following the, um, I mentioned it uh, before, the D-School design thinking kind of philosophy. And if you look at that, the, the circles, there's five different steps or five different kind of parts to, to the design thinking model. Kind of empathy is usually up front and then testing is at the end. And I think having researchers involved in the process for those two things is essential. I, I feel like it's a lot of times, you know, we people and, and businesses and, and um, you know, market marketers or, or product people look at research as kind of a nice to have. And I, I really do kind of think that it, in, at least in those two uh, areas, up front and then uh, at the end, it really is essential. It's, it's, it's a must have. What is research doing for the process or for the team or for, you know, what's the impact of research in those two different stages of the process? So I think the easy one is the testings um, kind of downstream, right? So when a product kind of comes into into the business from and, and starts uh, having you know um, getting some some traction and uh, people start becoming you know working on it, you know usually a prototype uh, is made. It depends on what kind of product. For us uh, uh, doing UX research, most of the time it's it's digital. It's but um, you know that's not. To say that it's always the case, it could be a physical product, it could be an experience, it could be a, a service of some sort. And usually after a prototype is made, then the researchers come in and that's when that prototype is kind of smoothed out. So usability test, tests are kind of bread and butter for UX researchers. But in many cases, I think up front, the research hasn't, you know, the the teams don't bring in, in, in uh, they, the teams don't bring researchers into the process to begin with. And I think that there's a real impact and a real value that a way for, you know, product teams to kind of set themselves apart and making sure that the product that they're creating has been tailored to a specific need. I mean, I kind of see in, you know, s simple terms that a product is basically satisfying a need and the, the way that you find needs, and it's a very tricky business, but the way that you find needs, in my uh, in my opinion, is through empathy and through going out and and kind of applying the methods that um, we as researchers use to kind of make things a lot clearer and distill down the essentials in terms of what the problem areas are, what the need areas are. You know, jobs to be done for framework. I think gets this right too. Where I was just watching a, a webinar, I think. And I really like this this phraseology that they used. They were thinking about milkshakes, right? And like why milkshakes were being sold more uh, in the mornings during um, during the work week than any other time. And the way it was framed was 
what, what are they hiring a milkshake for? And I really like that kind of reconceptualization about thinking of, uh, about products and about services. And what do you, why are you, you know, hiring your computer? Or why are you hiring your water bottle? And thinking about it that way, I think really can kind of generate uh, interesting new ideas. And that's kind of the heart of, of innovation, uh, in my opinion. When you at, at Fabric have these initial conversations with teams at the bank, what are they looking for? Like, do they have a product? Are they looking for needs? How are they kind of framing that initial interaction with you? Uh, most of the time they come, they have a product uh, that's kind of either out there and in, in kind of in the wild or, or um, an MVP or a prototype. And they want us to kind of help them bring in users, have them put that, put that product in front of them and kind of observe their behavior and kind of get back to them with the findings about um, whether they, the users kind of could understand whether there are any kind of um, issues with the content issues with the lexicon, this, th these kind of things. Uh, and so, you, you know, we, we work with, with the, the di uh, digital team. We also, we work with uh, other departments within Fab on, on kind of a lot of product testing. And a couple of months after I, I started, um, I started interacting and working with uh, the head of marketing. And we kind of created a market research branch uh, off of Fabric. So now any type of market research um, initiatives comes through us and uh, we we test ads we do um, more discovery type type work about products you know for example there was one credit card so fab has 22 different credit cards if you can believe that and um, the one that was performing the worst was a, a card called gems card and we were able to bring in people who were using the card and kind of getting their their sense about why they're not using it more why um, kind of are they confused about the point system or, you know, kind of just getting them to kind of talking and, and having an informal kind of discussion about problem areas and uh, things that we can improve and kind of the whys as to the underperformance. So, yeah, was that, did that answer your question? Sure. And it, 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 it raised another one. So that, that says we're, we're going somewhere we want to go. So I guess that raises a question for me around the definition. So I think you're describing that as a market research project. How do you define or delineate what, uh, you know, what's UX research, what's market research? How do you think about it? It's interesting. Um, I think of it all as kind of the same thing. I mean, this is now kind of being in the industry for, for as long as I, I have been, I've seen, I've kind of seen, um, seen different titles or, or, or worked with different corporations, you know, things like human factors, things like uh, user research, UX design designers. And I, I think that at the end of the day, it's, it's really all kind of coming from the same place, or I guess the, it's all looking towards the same thing when it comes to, to all these, you know, you, you know, human factors or UX or market research. Just at the end of the day, it's trying to answer questions with, with data from your actual, your, your, your customers. And it's trying to get at the need, I think. It's trying to find needs and trying to discover needs uh, and then trying to help the people who make the products or make the services, uh, make them better, make them more, not just making making people not just you know listening to people about their problems with a product or their problems with their their day-to-day -day life but really trying to understand the motivation and understand um, their feelings and, and their desires and kind of satisfying them with with services and 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 products so I want to ask a different question following something you said before you talked about these sort of four areas and, and where culture was like a really important one yeah. I mean, from where I sit in California, I'm curious about culture in your organization, because not only are you, you know, in a specific industry, which based on my experience, like banking has a certain culture sort of historically around, and, you know, maybe that's very much an, an American perspective, but a regulated industry with certain history means there's a certain approach to decisions and a certain approach to quote risk and, and so on. But you're in a very different region of the world than I am. And I'm, so I'm, that makes me wonder, what observations do you have about the regional business culture and, and how, that, how that responds to innovation uh, and the changes that innovation is asking for 
as well as financial banking kind of services culture as a, as a factor that characterizes the, the culture that you're working in? So I, I think culture is um, changing the culture is one of our core missions with one of Fabric's core missions. So it's a work in progress. You know, I think Fabric and then uh, Fabric versus Fab, I think within Fabric, we kind of have a, our own culture. It's a little bit different than kind of the corporate button up tie, tie wearing, jacket wearing traditional stereotype of, of the banker. Um, I don't see too much of that, uh, that stereotype um, within the bank, you know, meeting with people in, uh, in different departments. But yeah, I, I think work, I, I've worked in the corporate setting a couple times. And I think kind of there is there is a, a difference. There is a division between the traditional normal kind of roles that you would think about when you think business versus kind of the UX or user research designer type type people. And it's just, it's something that, yeah, it's I, I feel like there should be more integration. I would I would like to see more integration in the future. And just from a, a business point of view, I think it's it's good business to kind of have people like us at the table. Uh, and in many cases uh, it's it's there you know we're not we're just not there uh, yet. And it's something I think that organizations struggle with about how to kind of, you hear a lot of people, you know, a lot of people in the industry, I don't know if if you get this as well, but talk about when they're working in a big corporation, like to evangelize, you know, that user research or just kind of UX in general has to be evangelized, right? It's kind of a little bit uh, like, you know, first off, it's it's not great that it even needs to be evangelized. Uh, And then the second part is, is like, how do you actually, what's the best way to to evangelize, yeah, we talked a little bit about educate. I think the the way the approach that we have is kind of through education, events, these these kind of kind of um, cultural events, and then and then just producing you know kick ass work. What do you think would be different if you were at Fabric within Fab, but you were this was a company in Manhattan or this was a company in London? Do you think there's any regional shifts that you would see? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I when I first moved out here, I was expecting it to be a lot more of a culture shock than than I was than it actually was. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there would probably be some some differences, uh, without a doubt, less sand. But uh, I think for the most part, though, it, it's it, it w- there wouldn't be much. It's it's funny. Dubai actually um, has, I think it's 80, 80 or eighty five percent expats. Right, so there are very few locals and uh, nationals, UAE nationals. Uh, so the bank is comprised of a lot of people from a lot from all over the world. Right, so it's a very diverse, very multinational community. Not uh, not too many people from the states, but a lot of people from from England, a lot of people from uh, Australia, India. Is there's uh, a high percentage? So yeah, it's this kind of melting pot uh, and it's it's a really cool and interesting environment to work but i think at the end of the day yeah it's it's people are kind of people so do you have any sense of business community whether it's you know outside your organization but in the region you know what the awareness or adoption of you know user experience user experience research elsewhere outside of fab yeah, so it, it's something that's that is um, I think taking off and growing within the within the region. I know for us personally, what we want to do is Fab uh, not only serves the UAE, but uh, it also serves uh, other countries uh, in the MENA region, like Egypt and like um, Saudi Arabia and others. And I know that we as Fabric have kind of goals to take uh, certain elements of our of our uh, of our toolkit and our service. And kind of export them into into these regions, right? So research being one of them, I think, because of its kind of universality uh, and its 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 way for you know you can kind of use it in in many different contexts. So so that's definitely exciting. Um, but you know, it's it's funny. I think user research and, and UX in general is kind of a very niche uh, industry. So even within the United States, you know, a lot of people don't don't really know about it. Whereas in in this region, it's almost like I think there's a lot of people who don't know about it about it as well. But I, I think that the re- receptivity they're, they're they're much more receptive to kind of embrace these kind of new and maybe kind of non-traditional ways of, of, of approaching work. And I think that's really um, exciting. 
Yeah, sounds very positive. You know, we've we've talked in and around this a little bit uh, as you've talked about some of the ways that Fabric is working with teams throughout the bank and so on. When you start working with these teams, what kinds of disciplines or functions or roles do you most, or is there a typical set of roles that you are collaborating with most directly? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, marketing for one, because Fabric and marketing, there's kind of this dotted line between Fabric, Fabric's research team and, and then the market research that we do. So that's definitely uh, a division that we work with very closely. We started working with with product a, a lot. We're doing some kind of foundational, fundamental uh, research, a project that we're really in, really excited about um, on personal loans. But hopefully, it can kind of spread, and we can do this this kind of, kind of research stream with all the different products to really start from the ground ground floor and get those needs and kind of assess and um, evaluate the current state of the products and then kind of and kind of move forward and evolve, and evolve it from from there we work with the digital team a lot a lot of times that the guys will come uh, and and request meetings for a, you know to do kind of benchmarking testing like i said before a lot of usability uh, testing te- touch point testing sometimes card sorts every now and again uh, some kind of upfront research about kind of ideas and con- concept testing and, and this type of thing uh, but for the most part, it's kind of product testing. It's, yeah, I mean, we've been, worked with a, a lot of different departments, which has been great. I think we had 25 or 28 different research projects completed last year. The vast majority of them were, was from PPG, which is Personal Banking Group. Uh, we have corporate banking. We haven't been working with corporate all that much, uh, but that might be changing in the next couple um, next couple weeks. Uh, weeks and months ahead, but we so there's also a team that that head that basically is a single product team. It's it's called Pay It, and it's a it's a digital wallet. And we've been doing a lot of different types of ethnography work, um, you know, competitive landscape um, research, uh, and you know, customer customer um, interviews and these types of things. So yeah, that's been exciting too because I think that the digital the e wallet space is is a new one, and I think it, it could be. It can, it can, there's a lot of value in, in kind of thinking differently and really trying to figure out the, the needs of people and, and why kind of a, a digital wallet exists uh, or why they exist and then kind of helping them shape and, and smooth the experience. And are there situations where Fabric is proactive as opposed to responding to a request from one of these teams, you know, initiating some effort, some program from within Fabric? Does that happen? I think at the beginning, once we started kind of ramping up, we were so busy that we were just focusing on the projects that were kind of coming to us. And there were times when we had to kind of deny or, you know, tell people, sorry, we're kind of hit capacity. We have no more bandwidth. Um, but I think with with this kind of Corona situation, we've had a time to kind of level set and start thinking a lot more about spinning out projects internally. The personal loan project that I just that I mentioned in my in my last my last response to your last question uh, was something that we kind of were developing ourselves. And when pro- product came to us, they were just like, "What's on your mind? What, what's kind of some some new stuff that you got? What's kind of what are you guys thinking about? How you know uh, we kind of want to kind of work with you? Like what what can you?" kind of offer us, you know, there wants to, we want to have this relationship. And that was something that was internal, an internal idea or an, an internal model, uh, internal project that we kind of then took off the shelf and, and applied it to product when they kind of came, came knocking. So that was kind of cool. I, you know, it was to give a, a little bit of a background. It, it's a new and in, in, uh, new and innovative way to think about personas and, um, what we really wanted to do was we wanted to, tr- I mean, I, I, I think most people within the industry, when they hear uh, persona, I think it's, it's a very it's ugly, ugly words in, in some people's minds. But I think that there's, there's, there's use and there's value to them. But I, I, I see them as, as being kind of a little uh, limiting or li- limited, right? So the idea for this project that we're working on with with product is kind of to do the personas the traditional way which is where you go out and, and you get together um, e- either through focus groups or, or in-depth interviews 
um, a bunch of a bunch of users, a bunch of customers within that specific product. You talk to them about their lives. You talk to them. You would get you understand all you know all their demographics. You understand their kind of you know their motivations, uh, why they're the other products they're using. You know, kind of a comprehensive three hundred and sixty degree view. And from all these interviews and focus groups, you know, personas kind of emerge out out of them. Um, so the idea is is to kind of take that traditional me- method and kind of mash it together with a method that's kind of been now being developed um, over the past couple of years with using machine learning and AI by feeding all of customer data uh, into an, an algorithm and have the algorithm then create the personas mathematically. And then if there's some way for us to kind of merge those two where you get kind of the best of both worlds approach because you know in in many cases the traditional ux personas um through research are kind of limiting i mean you can ask a lot more questions than you can with a data sheet you can get a lot more kind of subjective internal uh motivate motivations Uh, you can kind of capture those but the power of generalizing that uh is is not the same as the power that the the machine learning model has. And if there's a way for us to kind of, you know, understand that those, that those two, or there's a way for us to kind of push those two methods together, I think that would be a really huge impact for, for the bank. So it's kind of a combination of that persona piece with this uh, idea of service design, which in many, in in my, in my opinion is, is very, uh, very much just another method of, of user, of user research where you go and you talk to people, this is for personal loans, you talk to people about their experience, you know, um, uh, taking out a personal loan. So usually people who within the last three to six months have taken out a personal loan with with FAB, and you, you, you kind of map out the whole journey from kind of conceptualizing to kind of, get, you know, that kind of motive, motivation moment of like, oh, I'm gonna, I need a personal loan, why, why they need one. And then uh, going through the, the experience of you know coming to fab going you know signing all the documents and then you know lastly making making the payments and kind of having that map and looking for gaps looking for for pain areas of pain things that can be improved upon and if we kind of have those two models and we do those that piece of work for every product in in the bank we think that you know hopefully um, we can really change the trajectory of the products and, and make them more about kind of user user needs and user solving user problems than kind of how they've been set up so far. So that's an amazing approach. I haven't heard of anything like that before. And you're, you're talking about just like you said about market research, you're kind of blurring the boundaries or eliminating the boundaries between things that were sort of separate islands. And here you're pulling in two very different kinds of things to create one better approach it's very exciting to hear about. It's funny you say about marketing because I remember when I was meeting with, um, so the marketing team came to us, came to Fabric, and we did just kind of a normal, you know, textbook piece of user user research on some credit card designs, and then also asking them some just some questions about uh, what would get them to sign up for a credit card, and you know they were really happy with the results, and then they were like, okay, we want to kind of grow the team, we want to kind of have you hire some dedicated researchers and kind of have this, this um, dotted line between marketing and between UX. And I was kind of like, wait, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know marketing. This is not my world. Like I, I, I don't know if you have the right guy, but the more I kind of learned and the more I talked to the marketing people and, and the kind of decision makers, I learned that, you know, there, there really is not um, bright lines be, between product and marketing and, and research and, and just kind of thinking holistically about how products come about, uh, thinking about, you know, holistically about the economics, you know, how, why, why do products succeed? What makes, what, what are they for? What, you know, what makes a good one? What makes a bad one? At the end of the day, it all starts with, with understanding your customers. And that's what we as researchers do. We try to understand all the different facets of people and, what, what would make them buy and what even what is what is a product doing what purpose does it serve and when you start there then i think the marketing and the product and all of the those other de- parts of the business kind of just take care of themselves it becomes much more easier to navigate and make decisions based on this 
fundamental understanding of, of the, the people that you're serving. And right now, that thing, that activity is, we call it research. It, and, and, you know, people that yeah. do our job are the ones that do that. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's, in some ways it's a historical accident. Like you, when you describe this is what the process should be, you know, in order to get to these ideal results. And here's the activities that kind of started off, you know, the way that research is as a as a discipline has has done evangelizing, has invited other people to participate uh, and sort of said, hey, you know, everyone needs to do this. I mean, if you, you mentioned the D school, yeah. right, the D school is like classic for saying, hey, we're going to train everybody to do this, not people with the researcher title. This is everybody's job. I mean, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a way of, of, re, of kind of reimagining what businesses are doing and why, why they exist and what their purposes um, are, right? I mean, it's, yes, I think at the end of the day, it's to like, it, it has to do with monetary gains and, you know, stakehold, uh, you know, making sure your stock uh, is going up and, and these types of these kind of economic questions. But, you know, when you, we say things like product, we talk about products, we talk about services, we talk about needs, and they can be really defined kind of in very broad strokes. And when you, when you define them in broad strokes, then, then the power and the use and the kind of the impact and the relevance of, of understanding your customers, which is what, as you're saying, is what we do becomes, I think, paramount, right? Because that's the way that you can separate yourself from the competition. Uh, it's not just about innovating for innovating sake, right? It's a, innovating to me is to just find a need and solve it in a new way. And if you can do that, uh, I think you're poised to, to, have, to have success. The problem, of course, is some of the bureaucracy, some of the politics that kind of happens in, you know, in the different layers within the business. And also the tricky thing of researching humans. It's, I, I love this quote. It was a, it's a physicist um, a guy named uh, Lawrence Krauss said, I do physics because it's easy, right? Well, it's, it's clearly it's, it's not easy, right? But I think what he was getting at is when you're, when you're researching humans, they're tricky, they're complicated. It's a little bit messy, right? He kind of loved, he was, his point was the elegance of physics, right? You can, be, you can describe parts of the world in very elegant mathematical ways, and it will always behave that way, whereas people were unpredictable. Uh, and kind of getting at the root causes and those root needs and those root desires is tricky, but if you get them, then I think um, I think everything falls into place. I would love to change directions and hear a little about what your trajectory has been, how you found research, and and what kinds of roles you've had. That kind of have, you know, we, we know about Manhattan a little bit, but you know, maybe describe more of that story. I kind of fell fell into this accidentally, actually. And I, yeah, I love this question by asking. Others uh, in the uh, in the industry, this one, because it seems like that there isn't a clear path into kind of the world of UX and the world of, of user research, which maybe would be, but maybe that's the case for all industries. I don't know. I, I, I have a hunch that this one is a little bit different, though. People get into it through kind of untraditional ways. Um, so, yeah, I, I was going to grad school in New York and I was getting interested and fascinated with science and I started working in a behavioral science uh, lab. Um, and I graduated and I moved to Brooklyn and I, I didn't have a job and I was kind of running out of money and I was, and I wanted to, to do research. I, I really liked the idea of, of kind of trying, trying that out um, as a, as a full-time kind of career. And the first job I interviewed at was a, like I was saying, a, a small boutique firm uh, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan uh, that did human factors engineering research. And I saw the research part, but the human factors part, I, I had no idea. About. Uh, and it was like a kind of a pretty low level, entry level position. And I, I went, interviewed, I got the job and I kind of just fell in love with it. And I never really looked back since. And kind of this idea of merging science and research and data with design was something to me that I never really thought about. And the and kind of, you know, for me, when I, when I thought, when I think of design, I always would think of kind of just someone sitting in a room, you know, twisting their mustache and coming up with ideas. I didn't realize that you can actually use science or use kind of methods, research methods to influence how products, you know, to shape products, right? Which is really what a lot of times what uh, human factors engineering does. Um, it, it's, you know, if you, if you looked at the, um, the, the D school model, it 
was it kind of lives in the testing area for a lot of for, for most of what it does. So I did that, and, and I, I kind of after six months of working there, it was a, uh, like I said, a small a small firm. The the my direct report left kind of suddenly, and the next in line. Um, so she, and she she reported to the the CEO, a guy named uh, Charles Morrow, who has been in the industry for forty five years. And then so that left a, a big wide open role that I, that he said that now it's mine and I was kind of again in a moment of crisis like I don't know if I can if I can handle this right like I'm only six months in it was a very much like a sink or swim moment and uh, now here this you know person who really didn't go to school for for engineering and, and research is now kind of managing uh, these huge projects for Amgen and, and Google I, I was I, I yeah I, it was definitely harrowing Um to say the least, but I kind of kind of made through it, and then a, a couple of years uh, after, I decided to to move to the Midwest, and I took a job working for more human factors um, stuff, working for a company called Medtronic that makes medical devices. I worked in the neuromodulation um, department, working on a couple of different products. Um, kind of flew around the world, uh, around the country mostly, uh, talking to doctors, kind of getting their their feedback. And trying to help the um, the sh- shape certain medical devices, uh, and then I kind of switched gears and got into the world of 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 UX and UX research. Actually, that same my first direct uh, report, a lady named Emily actually suggested we kept in touch after she left, and she uh, suggested that I start looking into this thing called UX UX research. It's very similar; it uses the same methods. Uh, of the methods of um, that we employed for uh, human factors employees, and I kind of thought that it was yeah it was I was getting a little bit bored of the physical products, a little bit bored with the medical devices. You know, tech was kind of boom, booming, and it was um, an exciting place to work. I thought that it would be cool to kind of open up my toolkit and start working uh, on screens. I did a little bit of screens, um, kind of within the human factors, but. Definitely not, not, not as much. And I started then working in um, a few different inter- uh, innovation labs. I worked for a company uh, in Minnesota too. Called, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, Best Buy. Not many people here have heard of it. And that was my last. My last role was Best Buy. It was before I, I moved out moved out here to, to uh, Dubai to help them kind of create UX research department within and embed it into the bank, which has been lots of fun. I think. So outside of fabric and, and the work you're doing for the bank, are there other things that you're working on in, in your profession? Yeah. So um, since the past year, year and a half, I've been kind of kicking around um, an idea, a concept of, of trying to think about you know, things like UX and jobs to be done theory and market research and human factors, all these different kind of disciplines that seem to be kind of putting uh, a lot of uh, weight on understanding the customer, bringing the customer into the, the design process, being customer obsessed. And um, I kind of kind of all kind of felt, I was thinking about writing a book about U, uh, UX research, more technical. Then I was working in, um, in Best Buy and I, I struck up a friendship with, with um, a guy named Jay Reeder, who was, um, was a graduate from the Stanford D school. And he kind of, introduced me i brought brought him the idea of the book and he kind of introduced uh, introduced me to different material uh different kind of literature and material that the the d school was kind of putting out in their philosophy which i had heard of design thinking but i i I hadn't really dove too deep in it so we had a lot of interesting conversations about design thinking and you know books like need finding by um Dev Panic and the um, books by the, the Kelly brothers kind of, I started um, kind of getting interested in, in, in that and, and design thinking I, I felt was, was very cool approach to, to kind of what you, you user researchers were doing already, right? When, when we do user research, we're trying to make better products and we're trying to kind of design help, you know, collect data to help designers and to help product people shape products and, and make really um, uh, better experiences. And, you know, I, I found I found that it was really hard for that. Well, that, you know, a way that when, when you look at the design thinking framework 
in many cases, research is not so much talked about. When you get kind of down into the details, they do talk about how empathy, which is kind of the first pillar, the first step, uh, requires kind of a journalistic kind of anthropological uh, mindset, kind of going out and observing people and asking them questions and, and watching how they use the product and seeing the context uh, on, on all of these kind of kind of more research stuff. And I thought that, yeah, that this was a, a really cool model, but I, th I thought that it kind of needed a little bit, uh, uh, it was maybe outdated a little bit. In many cases, it, it was it was used for uh, physical products. And now I think because the world is becoming digitized, so there's so many now, so many services and products that are now on um, on a screen. And I, I think that kind of user research, um, especially for digital products, I think that looking at them as as a product, I think in, in at the end of the day, I think some people when they look at uh, you know a a journey, for example, uh, you know a bunch of screens to get you to sign up for a loan, that that is actually a, a product if, if if you define if you can you, you can actually define it that way. And when you start looking and seeing all the different products, you know that almost if anything is customer facing, and and you know you, you can use it, or uh, you know Facebook is a product, or Candy Crush is a product, all, all these things. You, know, you can look at them uh, through this kind of new lens uh, as, okay, this is a product, this is a service. Then the kind of the design, the D-School um, design thinking kind of applies. And the problem, I think, well, one of the problems with the D-School is that it just doesn't go far enough into the methods and into the kind of the, the deep dive that user researchers kind of do, the, the kind of the ways that we kind of understand problems and the, and the, and the knowledge that we build through our methods is something that can really, I think, benefit the, the upfront beginning empathy part. So if if people, and this is kind of the 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 kind of the, the theory or the the thesis of the book is is that if you do your due diligence and you do your research upfront before 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 you even have con, uh, an idea about what the product is, that will actually help you know go wading out into that kind of unknown area. And kind of relying and, and believing in research that 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 that's the way to kind of kickstart these 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 products and, and these projects, uh, and that's kind of the kind of the idea. Where where are you at in that process? And do you have a title? Like, is there a place we can find out more? Yeah, so it's still pretty new. I'm kind of it's all outlined right now, and the, kind of the writing has has began, uh, but very slowly. So I, it's the tentative title is. The universal lens, and yeah, yeah. Hopefully, uh, I you know I can kind of get it get it uh, to completion. I kind of have some more time on my hands now with with everything that's happened, um, with kind of the work slowing down because of um, you know Corona and and all this and uh, social distancing. So hopefully by next year we can um, I can have something something to share you know with the world. So we'll see. And what is the universal lens? Yeah, so the, the universal lens is the metaphor is you know looking at the world like kind of as I was rambling on you know before if you look at the world as uh, everything is a kind of a anything could be a product or, or, or a service and kind of the way that that products are just basically solutions to needs then uh, that is kind of the, the the universal lens that this kind of framework is applicable to whether you're designing a, a medical device or you're, you know, you have a shoe, a running shoe or a bank app uh, or a chair. Um, it's all kind of at the end of the day, understanding user needs, then from based on what those, those needs are solving them with a service or solving them with a product that will, that will at the end of the day, uh, hopefully make that, that product successful. You know, we talk a lot about experience, uh, and I like to use the term smoothing the experience. Uh, and many, and many times when, when you know, we as researchers work on these projects, the product themselves does, didn't really seem like it was vetted. It, it seemed like it kind of like uh, you, you ask the question, what is the product for? And, you know, I think that there's kind of I look at needs as proximate needs and uh, almost, you, you know, kind of like um, so proximate needs and uh, ultimate needs and an ultimate need is why the product exists in the first place. And then the proximate need is kind of the experience of, of using that product, right? So if you take, for example, a hamburger, that's a product. And the ultimate need is the hunger that it satisfies, right? We as humans need to 
eat things and hamburgers are, are one of the, one of those things that we can't eat. And that's the kind of the, the universal need that we, that it, it solves. But then there's also the needs of, you know, the needs of actually getting it, you know, getting to the, to the place, getting to the restaurant. Um, then there's the, the needs of having a good experience in line, being able to read the menu, being able to take it to go if I wanted to. So there's these kind of, kind of nested needs within the kind of greater need of why the product exists. Both are important, um, but I think that product teams don't always take both into account. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's great to hear what you're working on, what you're thinking about, and uh, just some of these bigger picture ideas. I think they'll really be very interesting. So um, thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Steve. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Tell your colleagues about Dollars to Donuts and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find Dollars to Donuts on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Google Play and all the places where pods are catched. Visit portugal.com slash podcast to get all the episodes with show notes and transcripts. And we're on Twitter at Dollars to Donuts. That's D-O-L-L-R-S-T-O-D-O-N-U-T-S. Our theme music is by Bruce Todd.